although I'm quite playful as a person, I take my work, and particularly this work made in sacred places, quite seriously. The centuries-old temple and shrine grounds on which I photograph instill an extraordinary sense of awe and respect. And while recognizing that I have brought to them my own personality and vision as an artist, and of course that is essential, I also seek to honor these places. As I headed over to the Philadelphia Episcopal Cathedral, I was thinking how incredibly difficult it is to master any single artistic field. The artist whose new work I was about to see has excelled in two very different ones. Woodworking and photography. My name is Richard Kagan. I'm a Philadelphia-born photographer and former furniture maker whose career took a curiously circuitous path. I began as a self-taught street photographer when I was a student at Temple University. But after leaving college to practice Buddhism under a Japanese Zen master in New York City, I became so impassioned with the silent eloquence of handmade objects, I pawned my camera to buy woodworking tools. After several years of apprenticeships, I opened my own furniture workshop and at the same time founded the Richard Kagan Gallery, which I'm told was the first nationally recognized gallery for contemporary furniture makers. I first met Richard back in 2015 while working on a movie for Ruth and Rick Snyderman, who were celebrating their 50th year representing the finest artists of the American craft movement. Richard told me that Ruth Snyderman showed the first dining table he ever made in Philadelphia, bought the first photograph that he ever sold, and gave him his first photographic exhibition. I used to live on South Street, and my business was across from Richard Kagan's. When he decided he wanted to have a furniture gallery, we gave him the furniture makers we had, and he had his gallery for 10 years, and we were best friends, still are, and then he decided he didn't want to run the gallery anymore, and then we bought it back from him. And then we had it in the 80s for about 10 years. And I always loved Richard's black and white photographs. We had shows for him at the Works Gallery, and we owned some ourselves. And then when he told us he was doing the color photography, and he asked us to come in and see them, I thought, oh, Rick, we're going to hate them. What are we going to say? And we went in and we were blown away by them. And I love the scale of them, and they're so beautiful in this setting, and you just feel the spirit in them. Richard's furniture making earned him a 10-year teaching job at Philadelphia College of Art, now known as the University of the Arts. And his work was shown in museums across the country. But a back injury made his woodworking impossible. But the silver lining in that black cloud was that it opened the possibility of returning to photography. It brought me back to where I began. Beginning photography again in 1988, along with academic studies and assisting other photographers, most notably David Lieb, I went on to have solo photography exhibitions in the United States, Great Britain, and South America. 
Just as Richard learned from more experienced photographers, younger ones learned from him, including the gifted subject of one of my films. I'm John Singletary and I'm a photographer, multimedia artist in Philadelphia. Worked for Richard Kagan for 10 years, something like that. And I'd say 70% of what I know about being an artist in practice comes from his mentorship and he's had a profound impact on my life. What do you think of this show? I think it's beautiful work. I was working with him at the time that he made these photographs. He was planning to go shoot uh, black and white traditional landscapes. It put me through this rigorous test of taking two lenses and focusing on an eye chart, all of these sharpness comparisons and testing tripods and all this stuff. And he comes back with work that was unlike anything that I had expected or ever seen him do. It took me a little while to get oriented with it to understand the place where he was coming from, but it's, it's beautiful. It's easy to see why John Singletary was initially nonplussed by Richard's blurred images of sacred Japanese spaces. Just compare them to any of his Iron Portraits series. Crystalline modernist icons of incredible sharpness. For over a thousand years, Kyoto has been the cultural and spiritual center of Japan. And it's still home to over 1,500 wooden temples and shrines. All my life, I've been interested in old Japan's reverence for nature. But it was only in 2010 that I made the first of several trips to Kyoto. When I finally went, little did I realize that I was going to go through a complete aesthetic transformation. I had expected to make black and white photographs related to my previous landscape work, but the new images failed to capture the deeper truth that I was after. So I asked myself, how could I go beyond merely that which I could see? And as I returned to the same temples night after night, I began to challenge my preconceptions of what I thought a photograph should be. Though I had a heavy tripod with me, I experimented by moving the camera during 20-second handheld exposures, and surprisingly, the movement seemed to accentuate the stillness I was feeling, and it allowed something magical, something unexpected to happen. So I continued along 800-year-old walkways that were bathed in an incredible, uniquely amber and ethereal light from the lampposts along the path. Energy appeared to emanate from the trees and the silence was palpable. At that point, something within me shifted. I trusted my instincts, and I began to photograph anew, as if for the first time, without any need for explanation. There may be no need for an explanation, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Though I'm no expert, I've learned a lot more about the history of photography in the last couple years through my friend Don Camera. We've been making a series of films together about photo history. One of them was about an early form of photography influenced by Impressionist painting called pictorialism. Richard Kagan created a number of highly evocative landscapes in Europe, helped out by an award he received from the Arts Council of Wales. Could these be aesthetically related to pictorialism? I called Don Camera to find out. Hey Don, how are you doing? Hi John. I have a quick question. Do you know Richard Kagan's black and white landscape photographs? Uh, yes, I do. They remind me a lot of pictorialism. Am I right? You are correct. That? Absolutely right. There's a kind of a texture over his black and white photographs from that period that give it this atmospheric quality. And the faster the speed film, 
the coarser the capture and the more pronounced the little halide crystals become. So it looks grainy and it gives you this texture. And when it's really beautifully executed, Kagan is a great technician, it becomes this perfect veil that kind of covers and creates this almost serene quality. A lot of the pictures are about calm and serenity and those aspects of the landscape. They're incredibly emotional pictures. Emotional is the key word with a capital E. You really read them with your feelings more than your conscious, factoid, literal brain. Most of them look almost timeless, but some of them have very modern elements. Like there's one called electric landscape, and there are no trees. It's just these two man-made objects on a barren set of hills. Barren would be one word, but there's something very even beautifully serene about that hill. I mean, to me, it almost feels like a reclining nude figure. And then these two strange man-made towers piercing it through the center, that's as emotional as the other landscapes. It's just a different emotion. Giovanni Casadei and I knew Richard before he started to do photography. And then little by little he just developed from the black and white to this uh, digital format and exploring color. But I think this show is superb. You know, I really enjoy the fact that these photographs then don't look like photographs but they look like painting. It's probably not surprising that I brought to photography some of the same aesthetic concerns with which I made furniture, a quest for quiet, understated, and elegant forms. So many of my photographs have been about making something absolutely still, and yet possessed of an internal icon-like energy. Stillness is a major link between the object photographs and the landscapes. The connection between the stillness of my older black and white photographs and the newer blurred time sacred places color photographs is that the energy within the stillness is now apparent. Bruce Pollock. They're mysterious. I keep thinking there is ghosts in them somehow. They're mysterious because they're night photographs. Yeah, mystery. I'm Ann Minnick. I'm an artist here in Philadelphia. I'm a member of this congregation, and I think this show is splendid, and I feel that we are very honored to have it here. I'm Nancy Hellebrand, close friend of Richard's, and I think the show is absolutely beautiful. I think that he's done an incredible job. It's perfect for this place. The size of the prints is beautiful. I've seen them over several years, and I feel like it's knockout. My name is Richard Kent. I'm a friend of Richard Kagan's, and uh, I've seen this work in his studio. To see it on display here in the cathedral is just magical. When I look at a picture like this, it invites my mind to travel into space and obviously into time. This picture is so vivid for me, it becomes this portal into the night, into silence. Just a stunning picture like so many of the pictures in this exhibition. My name is Glenn Swan. I'm a professional shakuhachi name is Shoyu. I'm going to be providing some background music for the photography exhibition. Playing your instrument 
count as a form of meditation? Uh, it should. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And hopefully listening to it will as mm -hmm. well. Yes. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Sure. Thanks. So what do you think of Glenn's music? I think it's absolutely wonderful. And to hear it in this extraordinary space with my photographs, it feels like home. And so I ask of viewers to just stare at these photographs one by one and let your eyes adjust to another way of seeing. Let the photographs invite you into their own silent realm.